Hello, this is Jonathan Riley of Lawrence Gray and welcoming you to our webinar today on the topic of Common Contract Clauses, Lawrence Graham's A to Z Guide. This webinar is presented by Lawrence Graham's Projects Group as part of our Smart Law Seminar and Webinar Program. And I'm joined today by my colleagues and fellow group members, Rosemary Schwaker, Vanessa de Froberville, and Alex Beale. The format for today is that we will have four presentations, each of around 10 or 12 minutes, followed by our Q&A session, and we'll aim to close in around an hour's time. The PowerPoints used in the presentations will be emailed to all participants after we close. You'll see from the slide on your screens at the moment that there's a dialog box for you to submit any questions at any time during the presentations, and we'll receive and collate those questions, and then discuss the most popular questions and issues raised in the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. I would add that we have just over 100 participants registered for this session, and so I apologize in advance if we haven't addressed all of the questions sent in by the end of the Q&A. Putting together a commercial contract or navigating your way around one that you've received can seem a daunting task, particularly if the contract is lengthy and complex. It's easy to view some of the standard clauses found in most commercial contracts as just the boilerplate and to include them or review them without fully appreciating the legal and commercial implications of the way in which they will apply in the contract. So in this webinar, we provide an A to Z guide to those clauses most commonly used in commercial contracts with an introduction to the role of each provision, the latest thinking on its implications, and a heads up of any risks that it poses for the unwary. We're going to cover eight different clauses, more or less in alphabetical order, and I'm pleased to start our presentations by introducing Vanessa with our first presentation on A for assignment. Vanessa. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to look this morning at assignment and novation and all the waiver clauses. A for assignment. Assignment can be used in two contexts, mainly in the transfer of title of property, whether that be intellectual property or land, and also in the context of assigning rights under an agreement, such as the right to be paid a price. Now, note that I say the transfer of the rights and not the transfer of the contract or agreement. Now, the benefit of the contract is a right, and the rule under English law is that a right can be freely assigned by the benefiting party, provided that it's not a personal contract. The burden of a contract cannot be assigned, but we'll come on to that in a minute. The key thing to remember here is that if a contract is silent on assignment, it can be assigned. Now, those of you who remember your trainee days or article clerk days, perhaps in corporate when doing due diligence reports, one of the first things that you did when checking a contract was perhaps to flip to the back of the contract and check to see if there was an assignment clause. And if there was one, what does it say? The assignment is commonly used in business sales or intra-group reorganizations that are to be structured as business sales when the benefit of a business's contract needs to be assigned or transferred to the buyer. The benefit of assignment over other forms of transfer is that a party may assign the benefit of an agreement to a third party without the other contracting party's consent, and that's important. Now, I mentioned personal contracts right at the beginning, and I said that they could not be assigned. Now, examples of personal contracts are those that are so personal to the parties that they can't be assigned. So examples of that are perhaps publishing contracts or recording contracts. And also note that some debentures also can't be assigned. Now, I'm not going to talk about legal assignments under the Law of Property Act because they're slightly beyond the remit of this sort of more boilerplate review. Now, I've got up on the screen a sample assignment clause which is really a fairly standard assignment clause. And I think that if they're well drafted, they do prevent assignment. Now, looking at the clause in a little bit more detail, the clause here is mutual. It does not allow transfer or subcontracting without the prior written consent of the other party. Note that this clause does not refer to novation, which I'll come on to in a minute. The clause also in relation to a party, which is a company, a company may wish to have the ability to assign to other members of the group without consent. Now that clause that was up on the previous slide does not allow for this. Also, 
consider that a bank or other institution providing finance to a buyer, perhaps on an acquisition, may require the benefit of the agreement to be assigned to it as part of security. But again, the clause that was up on the previous slide does not mention this. Now, looking at other issues that you may wish to consider, I'm not going to go through each one of these uh, due to time constraints, but some I just wanted to point out. Consider whether assignment or subcontracting should be permitted with consent, whether the consent can be unreasonably withheld or not. Also, consider whether if you are going to allow for assignment of the contract, whether you need to change your confidentiality clause in your boilerplate part of your contract to allow for the assignor to give certain information about the contract to the assignee. The other thing that you may want to think about is does the boilerplate third party rights clause exclude the effect of the Rights of Third Parties Act and consider does the, does the assignee need to carve out that exclusion? But I think Jonathan's going to talk to you a little bit more about rights of third parties. Now, we've talked about assignment. We can't talk about assignment without talking about the difference with novation. Now, assignment is not to be confused with novation. Assignment relates to the transfer of rights under the contract, as I've mentioned. But it is possible to transfer the rights and obligations under a contract, and this can be done through formal novation. Often, novation is described as stepping into the shoes of a contracting party. However, strictly speaking, the rights and obligations are not actually transferred. A novation agreement is actually a three-way contract that extinguishes one contract and replaces it with another, in which a third party takes up the rights and obligations that duplicate those between the original parties. Now, the only thing is that with novation, unlike assignment, you do need consent. And some of the things that you might want to consider when putting together a novation agreement are listed on the slide. Parties will have to think about how pre-novation liabilities are to be dealt with. The options really include whether the outgoing party remains liable for certain identified claims only, or whether the outgoing party remains liable for all of the liabilities under the original contract. Or does the incoming party assume the outgoing party's liabilities under the original contract going forward and retrospectively? So all questions to think about when you're putting together a deed of novation. The other thing is to consider that the incoming party will usually request an indemnity from the outgoing party for any liabilities that the outgoing party retains and vice versa. So consider also the issue of indemnities. Now, if a continuing party has concerns over the incoming party's financial status, you might also want to think about a parent company guarantee and whether that's relevant in your particular situation. Now, we've talked about assignment, we've talked about novation, and the talk is really not complete without also looking at change of control. So I just wanted to touch on that. Now, going back to your trainee days, and your exciting due diligence reports, you often also looked, one of the first things was to look at assignment, and the other one was to look at if the contract contained a change of control clause. And change of control not to be confused with a change control provision which relates to a change in service, but a change of control is often included in the termination context and is often drafted so that the controlling shareholding of one party if it's transferred or changed significantly, then it will allow the other party to terminate the contract. Now, consider whether a legitimate restructuring of a large group should be carved out to allow for this. So the key question here is, what constitutes control? And you'll probably want to include a definition for this. And often definitions refer back to either Section 1124 of the Corporation Tax Act or often there is a reference made to the Companies Act. But do be careful about which definition you're using and which statutory provision you're referring to. The Court of Appeal considered this in the case that I've got up on the slide, which is Envirico and Farstad Supply. And this was upheld by the Supreme Court in April 2011. And the Court held that as a result of a holding company's pledge to a bank, 
of shares in its subsidiary and the registration of the shares in the name of the bank's name by way of nominee, then this meant that the subsidiary ceased to be a subsidiary of the holding company and the holding company likewise was no longer a holding company of the subsidiary within the meaning of section 736 of the Companies Act 85, which also is the same as section 1159 of the Companies Act 2006. So do be careful when you're drafting your change of control clause to refer to the particular statute that is most beneficial to you. Now lastly, I wanted to have a quick look at waiver clauses. Now a waiver of a contractual obligation occurs when one party indicates to the other that they do not want or do not intend to enforce their strict contractual rights or remedies. Now a waiver can be oral or written or inferred from conduct. Now a no waiver clause seeks to ensure that a party's failure to enforce its contractual rights whether deliberately or by oversight, does not result in their losing their rights or remedies. Now, I've put up on the slide a typical no waiver clause, and I have to say that no waiver clauses have been thrown slightly into doubt and huge discussion because of a court of appeal case, which I am now going to have a look at. Just before I look at the case in a bit more detail, just looking at the waiver clause that I had up on the previous slide, the clause provides for the following, that a failure or delay in enforcing an obligation under the agreement does not amount to a waiver of that obligation, that a waiver of a breach of a term of an agreement does not amount to a waiver of any other term in the agreement, and that a waiver of a particular obligation on one particular occasion does not prevent a party from subsequently requiring compliance with the other obligations in the contract. Now, looking in a bit more detail at this particular case that I mentioned, it's the Tally 2 Post Office case, and this related to a dispute over phone cards. And the Post Office sought to rely on a no waiver clause, which I've cut and pasted into the slide, which is clause 16. And the post office stated that Tele2 had breached its contractual obligation by failing to send a letter to the post office regarding the provision of capital for the following year. And it was part of the contract that actually they had to send this letter about the working capital on a yearly basis. And the post office notified Tele2 that they wished to terminate, but it took them 11 months to do that. So they waited for 11 months before seeking to terminate. And the Court of Appeal ruled that a waiver clause, which waived any right to terminate for breaches due to a delay, did not prevent the supplier from relying on the other contracting party's waiver by election. And the case is really a reminder that where a party continues to perform under the agreement when the other party is in breach, it's likely to be held to have affirmed the contract by either election or conduct. And the judge's comments suggest that the outcome of the case might have been different if the post office had actually issued a letter immediately or sort of fairly quickly after the breach expressing to reserve its rights. So some say now, can you really rely on no waiver clauses? I'm not really sure that's the case here. I think it's really quite fact specific and I'm not sure that the no waiver clause was particularly well drafted and we also have to take into consideration the really important fact that actually the post office did wait 11 months to enforce the contract. So that's my quick look at assignment, novation and waiver clauses and I am going to hand you over to Alex. Thank you Vanessa. I am going to talk to you this afternoon about some key contractual and legal provisions and we'll look specifically at entire agreement clauses and their ramifications and force majeure clauses. So let's start with E and take a look at entire agreement clauses. Entire agreement clauses do what they say on the tin. It is a clause which asserts that the contract as it stands constitutes the entire agreement as agreed between the parties and no pre-contractual negotiations or additional terms can be added to amend it. The clause provides clarity that the agreement as signed between the parties constitutes the entire agreement. So why is it necessary to draft such a clause? Well, under the UK law, there is a rule known as the parole evidence rule, which states that outside evidence 
cannot be admitted to supplement a written contract. So far, so good. That's the same position under an entire agreement clause. However, as is so often the case with UK principles and rules, there is an exception to this rule, which means that outside evidence can be admitted to vary a written contract if it can be proven that the contract was not intended to capture the entire agreements between the parties. This exception is not desirable as it exposes the parties to the risk that the agreement they have signed is not in its complete form. An entire agreement clause prohibits this exception from applying and therefore provides certainty to the parties. There is a distinction between an entire agreement clause and a non-reliance clause. This principle was established in the Witter case. In Witter, the purchaser relied on certain misrepresentations by the vendor which induced it to enter into the contract. The court held that had the purchaser been induced to enter the contract, that they may be able to pursue remedies in the tort of misrepresentation, even if the contract excluded pre-contractual representations. So in other words, not all avenues of recourse were prohibited under the entire agreement clause, and a tort claim was permitted to be brought. For this reason, an entire agreement clause will typically go further and state that not only does the contract contain an entire agreement clause between the parties, but also that each party expressly acknowledges that it has not relied on any representations other than those set out in the written contract. And the clause will expressly exclude liability and remedies for any other misrepresentations other than as set out in the contract. If you are signing or negotiating a contract with an entire agreement clause in it, it sounds like an obvious point, but be sure that the contract is in fact the entire agreement. Although the existence of such a clause provides clarity to the parties, it will also be a barrier in the event that the contract has not been drafted so as to capture all agreed commercial points. So that's just a word of warning. I've put up on the slide here a standard entire agreement clause which includes the drafting, as discussed, excluding any pre-contractual statements or representations. And you will see it includes drafting, stating that each party acknowledges that it has not entered into the agreement on the basis or reliance of any misrepresentations. Please be aware that under the BSkyB and EDS case, full case reference is up there on the slide for you, that it was held that an entire agreement clause will not necessarily exclude pre-contractual representations if there is a duty of care relationship. So to avoid this, ensure that your drafting makes it explicit that pre-contractual representations are to be excluded. The clause on the slide does this. It's in red for ease of reference. Just very briefly under this case, the High Court held that the IT supplier EDS as it was then made fraudulent and negligent misrepresentations about its ability to deliver a project within a stipulated timescale when it pitched for a £48 million contract to build, design, and implement a customer relationship management system for B-Sky-B. EDS argued that its entire agreement clause, which excluded liability for all pre-contractual statements, save for fraudulent ones, was inconsistent with there being a duty of care. The judge disagreed and said that the entire agreement clauses did not prevent B-Sky-B from bringing a claim for both negligent and fraudulent misrepresentation and it is for this reason, including wording such as that on the slide, is advised. Let's move on now to look at force majeure, which is a term and a clause commonly found in commercial contracts. There is no legal definition of force majeure, and therefore its meaning will be entirely dependent on the clause or the definition under the contract. There is a common misconception that the parties to a contract will be automatically relieved from performing their obligations if some kind of force majeure event occurs. This is not the case. The English law doctrine of frustration will only apply where performance is rendered impossible. In brief, the clause is used to exclude or limit liability where there is an event beyond the party's control which inhibits their ability to perform their obligations under the contract, often for a specified period of time as set out in the contract. The party will neither have to perform nor be liable to perform its contractual obligations for as long as the event continues. The clause will either terminate the party's obligations after the event has occurred for a certain period of time, or maybe the termination will be immediate. Again, that will be contract dependent. 
the party who is relying on the force majeure clause must establish that the event falls within the definition of force majeure under the contract. The clause will provide, usually in this form, for the events which could constitute a force majeure event. From a supplier's point of view, if the clause has been well drafted, it will state that it is not exhaustive, because it is simply impossible to anticipate the unexpected, and you will want the clause to be as open-ended as possible. As I've mentioned, force majeure has no definition in English law, and so what are deemed to be force majeure events will be dependent on the definition set out in the contract. Some types of force majeure events include fire, flood, riot. In recent times, I've seen provision for acts of nature which prohibit travel. This came about in the context of the dreaded volcanic ash cloud. And I've also seen provision for pandemics, which reflects the recent concerns about swine flu and avian flu. It just serves as a reminder that the term force majeure is fluid and by no means not open to reinterpretation or extension. The clause can be drafted narrowly so as to reference weather conditions and acts of God, or it may be drafted widely as any event beyond a party's reasonable control, which leaves things more open-ended. The drafting on the previous slide is an example of such open-ended drafting. The case up on this slide, Channel Island Ferries Limited and Sea Link, how that the phrase beyond a party's reasonable control could only be relied on if the party had taken all reasonable steps to avoid its operation or mitigate its results. So it is not the case, if a contract includes such open drafting, that a party can simply down tools because the going has got a little tough. There has been some recent case commentary on the turbulent economy, where it has been upheld that the economic turbulence is unlikely to constitute a force majeure event. Donald Trump has tried to claim that the global financial crisis should relieve him of liability under a U.S. personal guarantee for loans for the construction of the Trump International Hotel and Tower in Chicago. When the credit crisis led to slower sales of units in the property and consequent repayment difficulties, Trump tried to rely on the assertion that we are in the midst of an economic tsunami as being evidence that the turmoil is a force majeure event. Although this case settled out of court, Historically, economic force majeure has been rejected unless there is an express financial hardship clause in the contract. Courts tend to take the view that the parties to a contract are deemed to accept commercial and financial risk, so that economic hardship, even if severe, is not an impossibility. As I've already mentioned, a force majeure clause does not necessarily provide the parties with the opportunity to down tools and be relieved of their obligations as soon as the event beyond their control arises. The conduct required will very much depend on the drafting of the contract, but typically the following conduct requirements would be useful prior to the right to terminate. Notify. There is often a requirement of notification passing between the parties, informing the other of the occurrence of the event. There is usually a duty to mitigate. Only after a specified period, which can be anything between 24 hours to 6 months, can the right to terminate be invoked. Another way to mitigate risk is to have a contingency, disaster recovery, or business continuity plan. If the supplier can implement contingency arrangements and perform the contract rather than declare force majeure, then this has the potential advantage of preserving the commercial relationship. That said, it is important that the supplier can declare force majeure as a last resort. So always consider the contextual risks, whether they be geographic, governmental, social, and ensure that your force majeure clauses adequately covers off the potentially relevant risks to the supplier. Commercially, suppliers will not want to appear as though they expect to be relieved from their obligations in a wide range of circumstances. The most advisable approach will be to refer to specific events which the supplier is concerned may affect performance. For example, the severe ice and snow of the past two winters have alerted many businesses, such as food manufacturers, that their contracts need to state that severe weather will be a force majeure event. Those suppliers dependent on the UK's rail tracks may wish to make provision for leaves on the line. And it's on that note, I'm going to hand you over to Rosie. Thank you, Alex. I'm going to continue with the alphabetical theme by considering invalidity first and jurisdiction. Starting with invalidity, this is a slight mangling of the alphabetical order in that invalidity clause is also, or perhaps more commonly, known as a severance provision. 
And I've set out on the slide in some detail a sample clause, which tends to come in two parts. The first part providing that the illegal or unenforceable provision be deemed to be deleted, and the second providing the consequences of that. Well, the first question is, why is an invalidity or a severance clause needed? The validity of a clause in a contract may be challenged for a number of reasons. For example, public policy, such as a clause that is damaging to good government, or rather archaically damaging to marriage or morality. More commonly and more modernly, it may be a restraint of a trade, or as you may be aware, a penalty clause, which is unenforceable as a matter of law and public policy. The validity of a clause may also be challenged because it is illegal. So, for example, under common law, a contract to commit a crime is an illegal contract. Or it may be illegal by virtue of statute, as some legislation specifically prohibits certain contracts, such as price-fixing agreements under competition law. The validity of a clause may be challenged based on mistake. By that, I mean that one or more parties held a wrong belief at the time the contract was formed. And if that wrong belief induced a mistaken party to enter into the contract, the contract itself may be void from the inception. And the final reason why the validity of a contract may be challenged is for duress. The basic principle here is that a contract is generally only valid if it is entered into freely and voluntarily. A contract induced by duress is therefore voidable by the party who has been injured, and duress may include all sorts of forms such as economic duress, like illegitimate economic pressure, or any other form of duress that causes one party to enter into a contract that it wouldn't have done ordinarily. So if a clause or part of an agreement is invalid for one of these reasons, the severance or invalidity clause makes it clear that the rest of the agreement can still stand because the invalid part can be severed. Now, courts are likely to use the severance doctrine, which is a common law doctrine, even if there is no express provision in your contract, which begs the question, why should you actually use an express severance provision? Well, an express provision is useful for a number of reasons. First of all, it gives a clear indication as to how the parties want the position to be resolved. And secondly, and possibly more importantly, the courts won't use the common law doctrine of severance to rewrite a contract or to change its basic nature. So uh, if the common law doctrine of severance were to be applied and the contract were therefore to be some, something completely different, the courts couldn't rely on that common law doctrine, whereas an express provision gives the parties the chance to set out how they want the contract to stand in the absence of the invalid provision. The next slide just breaks down some of the key elements of the sample clause that I showed you a couple of slides ago. The first question, really, when looking at an invalidity or a severance clause, is whether the invalid provision itself will automatically be severed if it is deemed to be invalid or if it's invalid, or whether you need to go to court to get it severed. At the former i.e. automatic severance can be very dangerous as the parties may not know when it's severed, if it's severed, if it's still included in the contract, and what is severed. So providing that the parties need to go to court is often the safest and most clear form of action. The words deemed to be deleted aim to remove any illegal provision or part provisions in its entirety. But the question arises, what if the offending provision, the bit that needs to be severed, forms a consideration? And the answer to that is, if it's the main consideration for the contract, you can't sever it, because otherwise the whole agreement will fail. Similarly, if the bit that needs to be severed forms the main point of the contract or the main nature of the contract, and therefore severing it changes the nature of the contract, the contract as a whole will be considered unenforceable. The next few words are minimum modification necessary. And the idea here is you remove the illegality of a provision or the illegal words, but not the provision itself. And an example of this is where you have a non-compete clause. And it may be that you want to agree with your counterparty to have a non-compete clause for 10 years. But it may be that it's a matter of competition law that is questionable whether that's enforceable. So one way to deal with that is to provide alternative periods of uh, duration of that non-compete clause so that the courts can sever the 10 years, but, for example, leave in place a five-year or a three-year alternative that's there in, in its place. Although I would re-emphasize the court won't sever the provision if the remainder doesn't make sense or change the nature of the contract. And also, a court is not going to use the severance clause to rewrite the agreement between the parties. You may also wish to provide that in the event something is severed, the parties are going to negotiate in good faith to substitute the severed clause with it, one that stands in its place. Now, as a matter of English law, this could be construed as an agreement to agree, although courts have in the past allowed this to stand.
Moving on from severance or illegality to jurisdiction. Again, this is something that you may think is just buried in the back of a contract and is something that should never really take that much time or attention. But actually, it's one of the most complicated areas of the, the general contract provisions, the general boilerplate provisions. And here we have a sample clause that sets out in basic terms the, the essence of the clause. Well, why is it needed? It seems fairly obvious from the face of the clause that it enables the parties to agree which country's courts will hear the disputes. If you don't have a jurisdiction clause, then within the European Union, the Brussels regulation will apply, and outside the European Union is a matter of private international law. The Brussels regulation applies to all European Union member states. The jurisdiction clause is separate from governing law clause. The governing law clause determines the substantive law that will be applied, but not how the dispute itself will be resolved. And the usual practice is to provide that the governing law is the jurisdiction that the parties submit to, although that's not always the case. I want to just spend a few minutes now considering the Brussels regulation. Um, this is an extremely complex area of law, so what I'm going to try and do is break down the key elements. But please do feel free to submit questions if it doesn't make a huge amount of sense, because as I say, it's quite complicated. As I said, the Brussels regulation applies to all EU member states, and the basic rule of the regulation is that a defendant has to be sued in the courts of his domicile. Now, applying that to companies, companies are entitled to be sued in the place of their statutory seat, central administration, or principal place of business. And to determine this, it's important to look at where the management, control, and regulatory responsibilities are located. The regulation doesn't apply, however, to certain types of disputes, such as insolvency matters, and it can prevail in certain cases, even if the parties, the parties can choose to contract out of that basic rule by specifying exclusive jurisdiction, but uh, even in certain cases, the regulation can prevail and they have to do with sorts of personal contracts and things that are very specific to particular jurisdictions. But as I said, uh, you have the basic rule, and then you have the ability to contract out of the basic rule by providing an exclusive jurisdiction clause in your agreement. Even, however, if you have an exclusive jurisdiction clause, one party might cheat. And by that I mean that one party might choose to bring an action in another court. And that can be difficult, because as a matter of law under the Brussels regulation, no other proceedings can be brought between the same parties involving the same course of action until the court first sees, i.e. where the first action is brought, determines whether or not it has jurisdiction. So even if you provide with your counterparty that England and Wales should be the courts with jurisdiction, if your counterparty does the dirty and goes off to another court of the European Union, for example France, the French courts will have the right to decide whether they can hear the case before you get the chance to come to pull it back to England and Wales. Now, this can be a little bit difficult in certain courts because certain countries' courts have a reputation for jamming things up, uh, hence the reputation, though, the reference to the Italian torpedo on the slide. Italian courts in particular are known as one of the most difficult jurisdictions in the EU because things take so long in Italy to be heard. And therefore, the Italian torpedo, as it's known, takes advantage of this rule that the court first sees has jurisdiction. Because if you really want to muck things up to your counterparty, you can cheat on the to jurisdiction clause, go to Italy, and Italy will spend ages deciding whether or not it has jurisdiction to consider your case. In December 2010, the European Commission finally got its head around this and realized this was causing all sorts of problems for litigants, and so proposed a series of reforms, including the proposal that where there is an exclusive jurisdiction clause, proceedings brought in any other member state must be stayed until the court in the member state named as having exclusive jurisdiction has ruled on its own jurisdiction, i.e. the opposite of the current position. So in my example, even if someone did cheat and go to Italy, those Italian proceedings must be stayed, and stayed until the courts of England and Wales have decided whether it should be the, the, the case should be heard in England and Wales. Finally, breaking down the key elements of the jurisdiction clause, you may irrevocably agree that courts have jurisdiction, but what happens if the whole agreement falls away? Well, the Court of Appeal in this country has decided that even if the whole contract falls away, the exclusive jurisdiction between the parties should be valid because consensus as to what they intended to do on jurisdiction was established. Most English companies will provide for England and Wales to have jurisdiction, but therefore should consider if they are contracting with a non-domestic company whether or not there is a need for an agent for service, which is usually advisable when any of the parties is outside England and Wales to avoid having to comply with funny foreign rules about affecting service outside the jurisdiction. One question you might want to consider is whether your jurisdiction clause is exclusive or non-exclusive. Non-exclusive simply means that the party bringing the action need not bring proceedings first in the country designated. And then any dispute or claim which is referred to in the clause 
basically means that any disputes in relation to the contract should be brought in the courts named. In order to ensure that an express jurisdiction clause binds a third party, if you have a third party claim, an agreement should require a third party to give notice in writing agreeing to the jurisdiction clause, a precondition to bringing a claim. And any related agreements which form part of one transaction should probably contain identical jurisdiction provisions, as they may use be considered in one set of proceedings. That was all on invalidity and jurisdiction, so I'm now going to hand over to Jonathan to conclude the presentations on third party rights and variation. Rosie, thank you very much. Yes, as Rosie said, just in the final set of presentations, I'm going to look at third party rights provisions and variations clause. Starting with third party rights, how do you give enforceable rights under a contract to a person who's not a party to that contract? Although the starting point is the doctrine of privity of contract, which basically says that you can't do that. Even before the Third Party Rights Act, there were a number of ways of answering that question, which you still see in use today. One part of the contract might state that it's entering into the contract as agent of the other party, or otherwise in some capacity for and on behalf of that third party. Or the parties might provide collateral warranties, so that the third party enters into a collateral contract, under which it also receives the benefit of some of the warranties or other obligations given under the main contract. But there's also a statutory route by which this can be achieved, which is broader in scope and arguably more certain than the other approaches, which is under the Contracts Rights of Third Parties Act. So here on this slide are the sections at the heart of the Act. A third party may enforce a term of a contract to which he is not a party if that contract either expressly provides that he may do so, or the contract purports to confer a benefit on him and on the construction of the contract, the parties intended him to be able to enforce that term. The third party can be expressly identified by name, for example, X Limited, or as a member of a class or answering a particular description, for example, X Limited and its associated companies. And the third party need not be in existence when the contract is entered into, so in effect X Limited and its associated companies from time to time. For example, in Prudential Assurance and Heirs, a third party who was a former tenant of a property was regarded as sufficiently identified in a contract made between a subsequent tenant and the landlord by the expression, the present tenant and any former tenants, although on the construction of the contract, the relevant prison did not purport to confer a benefit on him. However, the case of Avramides and Colwell made it clear that the third party must be identified expressly in one of these specified ways and cannot be identified impliedly or by a process of contractual construction. Given that it's possible to grant an enforceable right to a third party if the contract purports to confer that benefit and the contract is construed that the party is intended to do so, then it becomes very important that the contract is clear either to expressly grant such rights and state on what terms they're granted, or conversely, to expressly exclude such rights. For example, in the Dolphin Maritime Services case, a letter of undertaking between a ship owner and a P&I club provided for payment to be made by the club to Dolphin in respect to the cargo which had been damaged when the ship was involved in a collision. Dolphin brought an action against the P&I Club to directly enforce that payment obligation under the Third Party Rights Act. In the event, the court held that the provision that payment be made by the P&I Club to Dolphin was in the nature of a payment direction by the ship owner and did not purport to confer a benefit on Dolphin for the purposes of the Act, even though there would be a benefit to Dolphin in receiving the payment. Benefiting the third party needs to be a purpose of the contract not just an incidental effect. And Prudential Assurance is another case which I've already mentioned where on the fact the former tenant who was an identified third party in the contract didn't have a benefit conferred for the purposes of the Act. But both of those cases could have been avoided simply by including a boilerplate clause in the contract excluding third party rights. The exclusion of third party rights should in fact be relatively straightforward because a simple statement to the effect that any rights granted to third parties under the Act are excluded should suffice. Even if the wording is less than precise for some reason, the meaning of the clause and the intent of the parties should still be clear. However, the case of Nissin Shipping and Cleves also tells us that if a benefit is purported to be granted and from the construction of the contract the intention of the parties is neutral, so to speak, then the Act will grant enforceable rights. If third party rights are to be granted under the contract, then the drafting of those rights merit consideration and the following issues should be addressed. Can the contract be varied without the third party's consent? Section 2.1 of the Act provides that where third party rights are granted, 
the parties cannot then vary the contract in a way which removes or alters those rights without the third party's consent if the third party has relied on the term. But under Section 2.3, this consent right is subject to any other expressed term of the contract. So the parties may well wish to ensure that this right of consent is expressly excluded in the contract. Which terms is the third party able to directly enforce? If rights are granted to a third party, then great care should be taken to properly identify those rights, because at this point, the gate is open in terms of the party's intentions, as it were. For example, if there are performance obligations in, say, Clause 4.1 of the contract, and an indemnity against a breach of those obligations in Clause 4.2, then granting a third party the right to enforce, quote, the obligations under Clause 4, quote, immediately creates uncertainty as to whether or not the third party has the benefit of that 4.2 indemnity. Are there any provisions in the contract with which the third party must comply when seeking to enforce its rights? The Act cannot be used to impose obligations on a person who is not a party to the contract. The law remains completely unchanged in this respect. But that's not the same as saying that if a third party is to directly enforce a contractual obligation, it must comply with the relevant terms of the contract, for example, a notices clause or a jurisdiction clause. The case of Morgan Stanley and China Heisheng Juice is a good example of this, where the third party was bound by the exclusive jurisdiction clause if it wanted to enforce its rights under the contract, even though it was not subject to that clause when one of the contracting parties wanted to bring an action against it in relation to a dispute associated with that contract. It's also believed that not only can the third party's rights be made subject to any limitation of liability provisions in the contract, but also the third party cannot challenge the reasonableness of those limitations under the Unfair Contract Terms Act, because the UCTA right only applies as between contracting parties. And the Third Party Rights Act makes it clear that the third party has directly enforceable rights, but is not treated as a party to the contract for any other purposes although I'm not aware that this interrelation between the Unfair Contract Terms Act and Third Party Rights Act has ever been tested in the courts. Then, to state the obvious, remember that if certain rights are to be granted to certain third parties, the contract should still then go on to exclude all other third party rights. This final slide provides a specimen Third Party Rights Act clause. You'll see that it starts with some square bracketed text, subject to subclause blank. And the intended structure of this clause is that if there are to be any third party rights, and they'll be described in that separate subclause. But then subject to that subclause, the application of the Act will be excluded. So that in the first subclause, you'll see first there's a clear exclusion of any directly enforceable third party rights. Then there's a clear exclusion of any intention to confer a benefit on any third party. There's an express statement of the right of the contracting parties to vary the contract without the consent of any third party. And then there's a general sweep up excluding any other rights under the Third Party Rights Act. Moving on now to look at variations. A variation clause is a clause which sets out the manner in which the parties agree that the terms of the contract can be varied. I provided a typical example clause at the top of the slide, and it basically comprises two elements. A requirement that the variation is in writing, so that the terms of the variation are clear and formally evidenced, and a requirement that the variation is signed by the parties so that the agreement of the parties to that variation is formally evidenced, which is all very sensible in terms of good contract management. But how effective is that clause? What happens if the parties agree the terms of their variation, but don't record or sign it as the clause requires? Or they don't record the terms of any variation in writing at all, but simply adopt a course of conduct which is different from their written contract terms? What I'm going to briefly discuss is purely the common law position. There are a number of statutes, such as the statute of frauds, which require certain documents to be in writing and or signed by the parties, and that so-called requirement of form must be complied with and also means that a contract required by law to be in writing can only be varied in writing. But those statutory requirements are usually irrelevant to the ordinary B2B commercial contract. There are two cases we can look at for guidance, and the case law in this area is in fact surprisingly limited, and these are really the only two recent cases of relevance. In Boots and Amdahl, the parties to a contract entered into open correspondence which contained an offer acceptance and consideration, the combined effect of which the court held was to vary their earlier contract, notwithstanding the absence of one written instrument signed by both parties. The court also considered and appeared to support an alternative argument that if the correspondence didn't constitute a variation of the earlier contract, then the agreement which had been reached through co that correspondence could constitute a separate contract in its own right. 
although in fact the court didn't need to rely on that argument, having concluded that the agreement reached through open correspondence did vary the earlier contract. I should emphasize that the original contract in that case didn't contain a variation clause, but one can reasonably infer from the judgment that, had it done so, the court would still have found the later agreement effective to vary the original contract on the basis that, having all of the elements needed for a contract, offer, acceptance and consideration, it constitutes the contract in its own right. Then in Iway and World Online Telecom, the court refused to grant summary judgment in a case which revolved around whether a written contract had been varied orally. The relevant part of the clause read, no addition, amendment or modification of this agreement should be effective unless it's in writing and signed by and on behalf of both parties. So pretty standard wording. The court regarded it as sufficient justification for a refusal to give summary judgment that, in the view of the court, the law on the topic is not settled. The court also said that an argument that the subsequent conduct of the parties meant that one party was estopped from relying on the variation clause as prohibiting the contract variation also could not succeed as a ground for summary judgment, and that this was an issue that was capable of being fact-sensitive in relation to both the transaction and the issue of reliance. Sadly for us, by the time the case reached full trial, the arguments had moved on, and the effect of the variation clause was no longer in issue. But without wishing to say something that the court did not, we can, I think, draw from the Iway case that a variation clause is difficult to rely on, or may be ineffective, if the parties have, in fact, both acted differently and in accordance with the purported variation, or if one party has acted in a way that reasonably represents to the other party that it has agreed to the variation, and the other party has relied on that representation. So by all means, continue to use the standard form of variation wording. And for example, if you have a contract with a variation clause and, say, a change control provision, make sure that the outcome of the change control procedure is recorded in a manner that's consistent with the variation clause. But just be aware of the doubts as to the efficacy of the variation clause. By way of contrast, the United States Uniform Commercial Code, for example, provides that a signed agreement which excludes modification except by signed writing cannot otherwise be modified. So in the US, a variation clause such as the example I've given is enforceable as a matter of harmonized state law. Two further issues to consider in relation to contract variations. The first is simply a reminder to you of the Third Party Rights Act that we've just looked at. If the contract grants rights to a third party, then the contract should be clear as to whether or not the contracting parties can vary those rights without the consent of the third party. And the final point is to consider the impact of any contract variation on any related contract. For example, the obligations of any third party guarantor. In Triodos Bank and Dobbs, Mr. Dobbs entered into a guarantee for the benefit of the bank in respect of two loan agreements between the bank and a company of which he was a director, called Acorn Televillagers. The guarantee contained a relatively standard provision to the effect that the bank could vary the obligations of Acorn under the loan agreements and the guarantee would remain in place. The bank and Acorn subsequently entered into a further agreement, which was in substance a third loan agreement, but which described itself as a matter of form as an amendment or variation of the original loan agreements. Court held that the substance of the new document was not an amendment or variation of the original loan agreements, and nor was it within the scope of the original loan agreements. And accordingly, the guarantee did not extend to cover the liabilities under that new agreement, notwithstanding the terms of the variation clause in the original agreement. The decision in that case is limited to a loan guarantee, but it may be relevant to similar situations, for example, where a parent company has provided a performance guarantee for another group company. By contrast, in National Merchant Buying Society in Bellamy, where the guarantor gave an all monies guarantee. The court held that when a guarantor enters into a guarantee under which it agrees to pay whatever is due now or in the future from the underlying obliger, then it makes itself liable for the result of future dealings between the underlying obliger and the creditor. And the variation of the underlying obligation does not discharge the guarantor. The court distinguished this genuine all monies guarantee from the situation where the guarantor enters into what is described as an all monies guarantee, but which is in fact a guarantee of all monies only in relation to a specific obligation. In that situation, a variation of the guaranteed obligations without the guarantor's consent will still discharge the guarantor's liability, as in, for example, the Bank of Baroda and Patel case. So the impact on related contracts is simply something to keep an eye on if you're dealing with the contract variation. So that concludes our presentations. In the five minutes or so remaining, we'll just briefly take some of the questions that have 
come in during the course of the presentations. The first question, Vanessa, is one for you, yep. if I may give that to you, which is yes. in relation to questions which I've actually combined into one, which is the position both in relation to assignment and subcontracting. What happens in relation to assignment if the contract itself is silent? And then in relation to subcontracting, if there is an assignment provision, but that provision is silent about subcontracting, can one of the parties then subcontract? Mm, Jonathan, they're good questions, actually. So if the contract is silent, completely silent on assignment, and let's say completely silent on subcontracting, then the party will be able to assign the contract and will be able to subcontract that contract. So it's important that if, for example, you're a customer receiving a particular service and you want to ensure that actually that service is only going to be provided by the actual supplier that you're contracting with and not by a subcontractor, then you have to state that in your contract. Now, in terms of the subcontracting part of the question that you had, which was, for example, if you've got an assignment clause but the assignment clause is silent on subcontracting, then if that assignment clause is silent, then that will allow for subcontracting. You just do have to be careful, though, how that assignment clause is drafted. I think in the example clause that I had in my slides, there was a bit of a sweep-up wording that had, or if you deal in any other manner, then you won't be able to do that. So it was a sort of general sweep up on the prohibition. So do be careful how you draft that, and if it's quite widely drafted, then it will prevent the subcontracting. But I think in the clause that I had, in the example that I had, it did actually prevent subcontracting completely. Thanks. But well, this is talking about the ordinary contract position, yes. is it? Where if you've got a personal contract, the position is different? The position is different if you've got a personal contract, such as the publishing or recording contract that I've mentioned, then you won't be able to assign that that contract, so that's the exception. Great, thanks very much. Okay. Rosie, one for you where the question board lit up about five minutes after you'd mentioned Italian torpedo. <laughs> Is it worth you just, just to briefly reprise the Italian torpedo issue again? I think sure. I'm surprised that this arises where you've got an exclusive jurisdiction provision. Yes, I mean the problem is that even if you have an exclusive jurisdiction provision, as I said while I was going through my slides, if one party cheats on that and goes to another court start with, even if, for example, if your clause provides exclusive, exclusive jurisdiction in England and Wales, if one party cheats and goes to another country, then the current rule is that, that country's courts have the right to consider whether or not they can hear the case first, even if they're not theoretically the courts of exclusive jurisdiction. And only if they decide they can't will the matter go back to the courts of the countries provided for in the exclusive jurisdiction clause. So even if you provide for England and Wales, if someone then goes off to Italy and says, Italian courts, can you hear our case? The Italian courts have the right to consider that question. And only if they decide no, will the case go back to England and Wales. And the problem is particularly difficult when Italy is the court in question, because the Italian courts are notorious for holding things up and for taking a long time to consider matters. So if it looks like litigation is pending, and for whatever reason one party to a contract wants to delay things, then if it rushes off to court in Italy and asks them to hear the matter, that may very well cause litigation to be held up for some time. Now, as I said, that is under review from the European Commission quite sensibly, and the review that the change in law is due quite soon. But at the moment, it is still possible to run off to Italy and torpedo the whole action. Thanks very much. And Alex, our final question, one for you, which is quite unusual, not one I consider that much, that on a force majeure clause, you, you very rarely see sort of what happens at the end when the force majeure is finished. The contract is seems to sort of assume, as it were, that things are back on track. But have you got any thoughts about what the perfect clause should say, as it were, in relation to the, when the force majeure event is actually finished? That's a good question. Typically, force majeure clauses are drafted, as you say, to suspend the party's obligations in a range of stipulated circumstances. But a well-drafted clause, or a well-drafted contract uh, at least, will include a clause stating that the parties shall be obligated to resume their obligations under the agreement as soon as is practicable following the end of the force majeure event, or if you are acting for the recipient of the services or the benefit of the contract. I think you'd go about including drafting, which states that in the event that the force majeure event, even if it's continuing, but ceases to have a material effect on the party's ability to perform their obligations, that the parties will resume their obligations immediately. 
So including such drafting will really provide for those rare instances where a force majeure event only performance um, temporarily, as opposed to more profound and long-term force majeure events, which typically see the termination of a contract, in which case the resumption drafting won't be relevant. Alex, thanks very much for that. Well, we will need to close our Q&A session at this point. I'm conscious that we've still got questions coming in. For those people who've submitted questions that we haven't yet answered, we will contact you in email, reply to those separately. And of course, if anybody has any follow-up questions, then do feel free to email any of the speakers after the event with those questions. The PowerPoints that have been on your screens during the presentations, as I said at the outset, will be emailed to all participants after we close. For those lawyers who have stayed the course, I'm pleased to say that this webinar is accredited and qualifies for one hour CPD. And our SRA accreditation code is on your screens now and will be in the pack emailed to you as well. Our next SmartLaw webinar will be our annual commercial law update, looking back at the key legal developments of 2012, which we hold in early January next year. And we'll send around details for that event in a couple of months.